many, many thanks to the Christians and family, to Steve, Van, Ardeen, Shasta, and for all of you for coming here today. Um, as you can see, the title of my talk today is The Mystery of Musicality, Revealing Relationships Between Music and Language in Chinese Comedy. China is a country that boasts over 150 different storytelling genres, most of which are sung. When I first began my dissertation research many, many years ago, my primary question was how Chinese narratives could be understood if they were sung. As a tonal language, Chinese words have tones that change the meaning of the word, even if the pronunciation of the word is otherwise the same. So Chinese tones both restrict at the peril of incomprehensibility how words and music can be matched. And at the same time, tones challenge narrative singers to make these matches more than just functional. So my question was, how do you sing a story in a way that is linguistically comprehensible and still musically appealing? The short answer is that every story resolves that dis dilemma slightly differently. And there are countless ways to negotiate text and tune in Chinese vocal performance, all with different consequences that reflect issues concerning social class, gender distinctions, and historical circumstances. As a musicologist, I've spent many years studying the elusive relationship between music and language in Chinese vocality in terms of cultural and historical processes. But during the past 10 years, I've also been intrigued by a couple of questions that most musicologists don't routinely address. In terms of cognitive function, how are music and language related? And how might that knowledge aid research in the humanities? As Ian Cross, director for the Center for Music and Science at the University of Cambridge has explained, music and language are two halves of the human communicative toolkit Aside from the obvious ways music and language are related, the lyrics and songs, the rhythmic and melodic contours of poetry, the frequent coupling of music and language in most forms of religious worship, are there other kinds of relationships between these two primary forms of communication that reveal their cognitive similarities and differences? This is the question I would like to explore briefly today, a question for which we do not have definitive answers but it is one that has provoked some fascinating inquiries among scholars in both the sciences and the humanities. So are there other kinds of relationships between these two primary forms of communication that reveal their cognitive similarities and dif differences? This is the question I'd like to explore briefly today, a question for which we do not have definitive answers, but one that has provoked some fascinating inquiries among scholars of both the sciences and the humanities. One of the best examples that demonstrates the intimate relationship between music and language as cognitive domains is a curious phenomenon known as the speech-to-song illusion, discovered by Professor Diana Deutsch at UCSD in 1995. While she was finishing work on the spoken commentary for a musical CD entitled Musical Illusions and Paradoxes, she had the phrase, sometimes behave so strangely on a loop, and noticed that after repeated hearings, it appeared as though the phrase was being sung as opposed to being spoken. Here is that clip. The appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. But they sometimes behave so strangely, they sometimes behave so strangely, sometimes behave so strangely, sometimes behave so strangely, sometimes behave so strangely. Okay, so you heard that. So she decided to set up an experiment in which she played the single spoken phrase, sometimes behaves so strangely, once for a number of listeners, all of whom were asked to repeat what they heard. Each participant repeated the phrase as a spoken phrase. Sometimes behaves so strangely, 
Sometimes behave so strangely. Sometimes behave so strangely. Sometimes behave so strangely. Sometimes behave so straight. Sometimes behave so strangely. However, in her second experiment, when she played the phrase 10 times in a row for the participants, they each reproduced the exact same phrase as song. Sometimes behave so strangely. Sometimes behave so strangely. Sometimes behave so strangely. Sometimes behave so strangely. So what Diana Deutsch termed the speech to song illusion demonstrates a fascinating perceptual transformation in which repeating speech shifts our attention away from semantic meaning and towards the pitch and temporal aspects of the sound. The end result is that the repeated spoken language actually begins to sound as though it were being sung. Thus, the speech to song illusion suggests that there is a deep underlying neurophysiological relationship between speech and song. So you may ask, why have scholars been so relatively late in the game in discovering these deeply rooted neurological connections? I believe that one of the problems that has impeded our understanding of the relationship between language and music has to do with our inability to see the difference between music, which is a product of history and culture, and musicality, which is a biological process that undergirds our ability to speak and sing. So today, I'm not going to focus on music, per se, but on musicality, sp specifically on some of the rhythmic and melodic elements inherent in both spoken and sung communication. I will argue that musicality is one of the most misunderstood aspects of communication, but it is hiding in plain sight, or plain hearing. In fact, I claim that musicality is operative right now in this room. The way we are connecting here reflects our collective musicality, which supports, enhances, and plays with the way we communicate language. Significantly, many scholars who address what I'm referring to as musicality are not musicologists or professional musicians. Rather, they are biologists, psychologists, neuroscientists, anthropologists, sociolinguists, and others who study aspects of language that one might call musical. While most of these scholars recognize rhythm, pitch, and movement in their study of language, they refer to these phenomena as expressive behavior, aspects of conversational analysis, and prosody. However, a significant group of scholars have actually used the word musicality to refer to the rhythm, pitch, and gestures associated with speech, particularly those scholars who have studied the highly sophisticated exchanges between mothers and their pre-linguistic infants for the past six or more decades. Detailed microanalyses of videotaped interactions between mother and infant demonstrate how the mother's exaggerated rhythmic sing-song vocalizations are directed toward and even more importantly, solicited by the infants. Stephen Malik and Colwyn Trevartan eventually coined the term communicative musicality to express the musical and dance-like nature of the proto-conversations between infants and their mothers. They believe that communicative musicality reflects an innate human ability to share a sense of time, shape jointly created pitch contours, and move with anticipated rhythms and emotions. Believing that it is essential to acknowledge the musicality inherent in the bodily and vocal expression used in managing human relationships, they argue that the word musicality is an appropriate and descriptive term to depict these rhythmic, melodic, and kinesthetic gestures. They explain, quote, we define musicality as expression of our human desire for cultural learning, our innate skill for moving, remembering, and planning in sympathy with others that makes our appreciation and production of an endless variety of dramatic temporal narratives possible. Whether those narratives consist of specific cultural forms of music, dance, poetry, or ceremony. Whether they're the universal narratives of a mother and her baby quietly conversing with one another. Whether it is the wordless emotional and motivational narrative that sits beneath a conversation between two or more adults, or between a teacher and a class. It is our common musicality that makes it possible for us to share time meaningfully together, end quote. These scholars suggest that musicality is the foundation for the infant's ability to learn language, music, and culture, and continues into adulthood as the root of successful communication. Ellen Dissanayaka contributes to the argument about musicality as the basis of communication by providing an ethological explanation for its centrality in human evolution. 
She argues that the emergence of bivitality necessitated a narrowing of the hips and a reshaping of the mother's pelvis, which reduced fatigue during upright locomotion, but resulted in giving birth to progressively large-brained babies through an increasingly narrowed birth canal. As a consequence of these anatomical changes, the gestation period was reduced, requiring constant attentive care for adults, from adults for much longer than any other primate. The behavioral adaptation that arose from the anatomical changes was the communicative behavior that would assure intensive maternal care for the helpless premature infant. Dysoniaca also agrees that musicality is an appropriate label since the interactions employing melodic vocal contours are organized in rhythmic bouts over time and utilize expressive dynamic contrasts and variations. Moreover, the interactions involve vocal, facial, and bodily movements, all of which occur together according to regular rhythmic pulses. Further, the verbal, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, and narrative elements of mother-infant communication are what she calls aesthetic incunabula, the nascent characteristics that eventually can develop into the full-blown arts of music, visual art, poetry, literature, and theater. Dysoniaca also suggests three intertwined points that invite further investigation in the study of musicality. One, the noteworthy nature of the signals presented by the mother. Two, the infant's strong and untaught receptivity to the signal. And three, the infant's active contribution to the communication. Beyond the field of mother-infant research, I believe music scholars who study the interaction between performers and audience mem members might also accept Dysoniaca's invitation to look more carefully at the relationship between a presented signal, its reception, and the receiver's contribution back to the signaler in musical performance. In other words, by looking at Dysoniaca's three points or interactive behaviors, we are considering the musicality inherent in the relationship between performers and audience members, the musicality behind the music. I will focus primarily on points one and three as signal and contribution. And then at the end, I'll address point two about reception. Of course, one could certainly argue that music scholars have already addressed similar questions about communicative interaction among performers. For example, studies of jazz have contributed substantially to an understanding of the intimate relationship between performers who present or create the initial signal and other performers who respond and contribute back to the signaler through their musicality. In Thinking in Jazz, Paul Berliner details the many ways jazz performers respond musically to each other by matching timbres, adjusting beat placement, mirroring rhythmic ideas, encouraging soloists, and engaging in imitative interplay. He explains, this kind of nuanced interaction requires what one musician called dividing your senses while listening to multiple band members at once. Additionally, jazz musicians converse musically with members of the audience whose responses, verbal or otherwise, cause the musicians to change the way they play, creating what Berliner calls a communication loop. <coughs> musicians listen carefully how the audience responds, and if the response is positive, the performer develops the musical idea further, thereby continuing to excite the crowd, allowing their musicality to animate their musical performance. I wonder maybe if this interaction might be seen as the inverse of Diana Deutsch's speech-to-song phenomenon, in this case, moving from a performer's musical presentation to a soliciting a verbal or nonverbal response from the audience or another performer. At any rate, communication between performers and between performers and their audiences has long been a topic of interest among musicologists. However, measuring and quantifying this communication in real time is difficult. A recent study that focuses on, on aspects of musicality and spoken exchanges provide some fascinating insights that may well help musicologists to be able to refine their elusive study of the musicality behind musical performances. Research published in 2016 from the University of Cambridge provides an example of a study that demonstrates the musicality or demonstrates musicality in the way we relate to one another in spoken conversation. The Cambridge researchers used Elon, which is a video analysis software to look at pulse and intonation in the spontaneous spoken interactions between pairs of same-sex friends in video-recorded performances. What makes this study unusual is that the researchers not only discovered a periodicity in successful bouts between the same-sex friends, but the results suggest 
that the periodicity may sometimes be accompanied by the systematic use of pitch intervals between the final accent of the first speaker's utterance and the initial pitch of the second speaker's response. And the success of the bout appeared to be determined by a high level of emotional engagement or attitudinal alignment, which is the descriptor used by the Cambridge researchers. The authors conclude that speech and song may both be underpinned by common neurological processes in certain contexts when the speakers are attitudinally aligned. In other words, it appears as though we sing our answers to each other when we are emotionally engaged, and continued engagement allows a successful conversation to continue. Thus, in addition to repetition creating music in the speech to song illusion, attitudinal alignment between speakers appears to be another factor that can cause a transformation from speech into what we might call a musicalized response. After learning about the Cambridge study, I immediately thought about a conversation about the conversational dialogue and singing performed by the two actors featured in the Chinese narrative genre known as Xiangsheng, a genre I researched in China. Xiangsheng is an interesting example in light of the Cambridge study because it is a performance tradition that outwardly displays both speech and song in the interactions between the two comedians during the course of performance. I wondered if using Elon to analyze a Xiangsheng performance might allow us to see a similar kind of musicality between the primary actor's presentational signal and the second actor's contribution in a real world performance, a hidden manifestation of musicality underlying their spoken and sung interactions. The two Chinese actors, known respectively as the joke cracker and the joke setter, or straight man, participate in a comedic dialogue that appears to be improvised, but is actually written by an author who specializes in the genre. This form of scripted comedy is conceived in four different sections, with the first three building up to the punchline, or baofu, which happens at the end of the fourth and final section. Moreover, Xiangsheng always incorporates four elements into a performance, speaking, mimicry, singing, and the provoking of laughter. While the first three elements refer to the way performers manipulate their voices, the fourth implies the two styles in which actors may relate to each other in order to provoke an audience to laughter. In the first style of Xiangsheng, known as heavy on one end, the main actor plays the dominant role to the straight man, who plays the ostensibly subsidiary role. In the second style, the two actors are equal, the second style is called two sides of a snap, referring to a snap on your clothing, indicating a mutual reciprocity between the two actors. As we'll see in the following example, some performances can include both styles in the same performance. Sometimes the main performer dominates, other times the exchange between the two actors is equal. Additionally, since audience response is also openly acknowledged as foundational to comedic performance in Xiangsheng, how exactly might audience laughter factor into the musical and verbal volleys of the actors? Well, inspired by the Cambridge study and what I had learned about Xiangsheng from my research, I began the process of looking for a recent performance of Xiangsheng and located A Carefree Life on YouTube, uh, featuring the popular actors Guo Degang and Yu Qian in a performance originally published in 2016. While I personally did not work with or interview either Guo or Yu, they are currently recognized as popular performers who have been particularly successful in updating Xiangsheng to appeal to younger audiences. So the recording provided a contemporary and popular example for the project. Guo's interpretation of carefree is reflected in his satirical treatment of elite Chinese cultural traditions. His hilarious portrayals of Chinese classical art forms lead to the balfu, or climax of the performance, in which he sings the concluding line of an especially difficult and notoriously high-pitched opera aria. But his final triumph only comes after a painful process of playfully harassing Yu Qian, who acts as a foil to Guo throughout the performance. Since I was unfamiliar with using Elon, I solicited the help of Joshua Sims, a former linguistics student from our college who speaks Chinese and is adept at using Elon, and my husband, John Lawson, a professor of statistics, to collaborate with me on the research. We wanted to look at pulse and pitch in the relationship between the two performers, which at least superficially appeared to mimic the relationship between the two attitudinally aligned speakers in the successful conversational bouts highlighted in the Cambridge study. 
Additionally, we wanted to look at the relationships between the performers and the audience in both spoken and musical exchanges during the performance, something that was not relevant in the Cambridge study. We noticed in some ways the heavy on one end type of xiangsheng, in which the main actor dominates, seemed to fit the definition of what music scholars call a presentational performance, in which one or more performers provide music, or in this case, speech and music, to seated audience members who are not perceived to be in a performance role. So the Chinese style of heavy on one end could be called presentational. Scholars contrast presentational performances with participatory performances in which audience members actively participate through vocalizations and or bodily movements. The performance becomes participatory when two things happen. One, the straight man has a more dominant role, and two, the audience cheering and laughter becomes especially prominent. Significantly, even though we were looking at the Cambridge study as a model, there appeared to be some interesting parallels between the Cambridge study and our project. There were also some major differences in performance and methodology between the two projects. First, although the scripted dialogue between the Xiangsheng actors is unlike the extemporaneous interactions between the pairs of same-sex friends in the Cambridge study, Audience reactions to the actors were both spontaneous and integral to the performance, constituting an element not present in the Cambridge study. Second, in Xiangsheng, audience response is constrained by the actor's performance, meaning the audience is expected to be listening quietly during parts of the performance, and therefore does not mention or does not demonstrate rhythmicity throughout the performance in the same way that a successful bout demonstrates periodicity in the exchanges between the two friends in the Cambridge study. Moreover, the meaning and execution of presentational speech is the focus of the performance in Xiangsheng, especially at the beginning. So we don't always see periodicity in the banter that might have otherwise occurred in everyday spoken interactions between the two friends. In addition to Elon, we also use PROT acoustic analysis software and R statistical software to analyze the fluctuating relationships between the performers and their audience. The details of the study are found in forthcoming papers, so I will, not, so I will just summarize what we observed and measured during the two bouts we analyzed in our project. The first bout features only speaking with no singing and showcases Guo's delusions about what his career would be like at age 140. Yes, 140. That's a good example of the kind of hyperbole expected in a Xiangsheng performance. The relationship between Huo Degang and Yu Qian during this bout is an example of a presentational style, meaning that Huo Degang in red dominates Yu Qian in blue during this part of the performance. The climax of the bout occurs when Huo claims that his acting partner Yu will still be performing with him at his advanced age of 140 years. Since Yu is a lot older than Huo, you ask how he will possibly still be around. And Guo points to an urn on the table, the one that will carry his cremated remains. At this point, there is significant audience response as they laugh at Guo's joke about you, signaling the end of bout one. Although we did not find regular rhythmic cycles throughout the bout, we saw periodicity for approximately 50% of the bout. And for the pitch data, we noticed an occasional matching of pitches between the last utterance of the first agent and the first part of the response of the second agent. However, when considering all of the pitch relationships between performing agents in the entire bout one, we did not identify pitch matching of any statistical significance. However, the second bout provided a very different scenario. The second bout showcases both Hua and Yu taking turns singing a difficult opera aria at the end of the performance. Yu tells Hua not to sing too high, so Hua purposely sings too low and then in a raspy sounding voice. And finally, he sings it high, too high according to you, who claims that professional singers can't even sing it that high. But you finally agrees to sing the first part of the line, and Guo finishes the aria as the audience cheers loudly. Here's that clip at the climax of the performance. It begins with Yu's protest for Guo not to sing too high. Guo then recites the line in speech. Then he attempts to sing it low, then in the raspy voice and then high, as you first resist, and then finally gives in.
，一见公主到令箭，留本宫洗心间，暗立宫门，叫小贩，就这叫小贩仨字来啊，来，别太高啊，嗯、别太高，嗯，一见公主到，留本宫洗心间，打理。来接这个，这这你要死是怎么着你？这干嘛呢？我这张不开嘴了，我这是这门不合适吧？我这个在太低了、哦，你早说呀，啊、给你换一把，再高点儿。于姐，你不知道，这这还不如那个要要低要高，要高一点，您这太过了，高一点，高点，叮叮叮叮叮叮，哎，这有点上府的精神，叮叮叮叮叮叮，嗯。你打死我得了！不是你太损了吧？这怎么了？不是，这吊门又太高，像这吊门啊，您这专业院团谁说相声没有能来的？哎，你这话不对啊！怎么了？说相声的我能来这个？你能来？你上前我给你一头来回试试呗。一头我来吧，跟我这个，我就不信了。一见公主到领间，为我的本宫洗心前，站立不安。说着没有唱这，再来，站立不安，叫小贩。谢谢两位。So the give and take of this bout <coughs> is clearly demonstrated in this graphic, where Yu in blue has a much more significant role with Guo, de demonstrating the participatory style of, of the performance, in which the two actors are more equal. Witnessing Yu's fear of having to sing too high and Guo's relentless teasing, the audience in green begins to become intimately involved in their drama during the second bout. In addition to the periodicity found in the analyzed sections in both bouts one and two noted above, there was a highly significant linear correlation between the pitch of the last syllable of the first utterance and the pitch of the first syllable of the response. And here's the important part. Pitch approximation happened between all three performing agents, between the two actors, between the actors and the audience, and between the audience and the actors. So the interactions between actors and audience members through reciprocal pitch approximations energized the second bout, demonstrating participatory interaction rather than the presentational style used at the beginning of bout one. By looking at the ways in which the performers are interacting with each other and with the audience, we see increasing frequency of pitch approximation in performance, what we might call an increase in musicality. Additionally, one could also look at a carefree life in terms of two sets of interactions, two levels of musicality that are occurring simultaneously. First, Guan Yu's interaction could be seen as highly participatory by the end of the performance. Second, the audience increasingly responds to the pair's evolving interactions through cheering applause by the end of the performance, thereby also participating in and contributing to Guo and Yu's performance as they interact with each other. So the findings from this study suggest there is a measurable degree of musicality in the relationships between the performers and between the performers and their audience, especially in the pitch approximation between audience and performers during the highly engaging balfu or climax of the performance. Findings that could be tested by other researchers studying similar kinds of recorded performances. Finally, we need to ask the question as to why there seems to be an uptick in musicality at the end of the performance, at a time when you and the audience, as a third performing agent, are participating fully. This is the point where I would like to address Dysonica's second point about reception. If you'll remember, in the Cambridge study, we learned that attitudinal alignment occurs between same-sex friends, uh, and this appears to be a prerequisite for what the Cambridge researchers call a successful bout. Similarly, I would suggest that the high level of emotional engagement, what we would call an example of attitudinal alignment, between the audience and the performers, as well as between the performers themselves by the ball floor climax, is the reason for the increase in the musicalized response between all three performing agents at the end of the performance. It appears that musicalized speech co-occurs with attitudinal alignment. 
I should add that not all Xiangsheng performances are as well received as this one. In the field, I attended several Xiangsheng performances in which the audience did not applaud at all. Yes, a rather brutal response to be sure, but one that reflects the belief that performers must woo their audience and meet their expectations in order to merit applause. In other words, in the cases where Xiangsheng performers do not engage with their audience, there would be little or no connection with the audience and therefore no rhythmicity or pitch approximation between actors and audience members as seen in the highly engaged concluding section of the of character life. The challenge then is how do you measure and analyze the ways in which audience members receive a performance before they respond? Aside from the fact that there were enough people responding en masse to produce a clear audio signal representing the many people, many of the people in the audience, there may have been some in the audience who did not respond with the rest of the crowd. How then might researchers ascertain the different responses of audience members, particularly those who did not cheer and applaud? <clears throat> One way to discover the various ways audiences respond to performers in real time is through interactive technologies found in facilities such as Live Lab at Master University. This is a performance space that has the capacity to measure the responses of audience members in terms of movement, brain response, muscle tension, heart rate, breathing rate, and sweating for select members of the audience in seats with equipment to take those measurements. However, the equipment is expensive, invasive, not transportable for use in the field, and therefore not practical for use in a typical concert or field setting. Nevertheless, the ability to measure the initial pre-applause responses of a select number of audience members, even under such contrived circumstances, allows us to understand something more about the different physiological reactions involved in the process of engaging with a performance, even before hearing or observing any outward behavior an aspect of performance that has not yet been adequately understood or studied by music scholars. And why might this be important? Well, we learned from the Xiangsheng study that a performance can at times involve a seated audience that is silent during stretches of the performance, and yet still be highly participatory, indicating that audiences may be actively engaged even if they're not constantly responding visibly or audibly to the performers. So emotionally charged applause following performance of, say, a Western classical music performance demonstrates how an apparently passive audience might be highly involved, even if not always vocally responsive throughout the performance. Or in the case of Xiangsheng, audiences might cheer and applaud intermittently during the performance. In the case of a poorly executed performance or an unengaged audience, there may appear to be no response at all. So measuring and analyzing the different ways in which audience members physiologically receive performances, which is Dysoniacus point two of her challenge, is an uptapped area for future research with promise for gaining a more nuanced understanding of different types and levels of musicality demonstrated between performers and audiences. Con conceivably, wearable technologies will become more advanced and widespread, supplanting the expensive, cumbersome, and invasive equipment that is currently being used to measure audience reception at present. With less invasive technologies, we should be able to measure our hidden but highly compelling musicality in the context of a performance in real time. In conclusion, one of the most, on the most obvious level, the alternating appearance of speech and song in Chinese Xiangsheng clearly supports Cross's claim that music and language are two halves of the human communicative toolkit. It's no wonder that the traditional rubric under which Xiangsheng falls is called Shuo Chang, or the speaking singing genres. However, the obvious way song is used intermittently with spoken modes in Xiangsheng is not the only manifestation of the intimate relationship between language and music. Significantly, the discovery of a hidden musicality in the banter between performers and audience members offers additional evidence of the reciprocal nature of speech and song. So the most powerful and widespread examples of the interactivity between language and music seem to occur when our attitudinally aligned spoken interactions actually become rhythmic and pitched. In other words, musical. And this musicality seems to emerge when we achieve a level of emotional intimacy with others. So much more research is needed in order to begin to generalize about rhythmic entrainment and pitch matching examples of musicality in comedic performance. 
but the analysis of a videotape recording using Elon and Prot could be replicated in studying other recordings of comedic performance traditions in which there are strong, measurable audio signals from the audience. And tracking listeners using wearable technologies would help in learning more about the subtleties of audience reception. So finally, the under-researched phenomenon of musicality seems to be manifested in our fundamental ability to communicate. It also appears to be the birthright of every human being, and although I've not demonstrated this today, I suggest musicality is also foundational to human music. And what might be the implications of studying musicality in different contexts? I think the following are interesting questions to consider. How do the aesthetic imponabula, or the building blocks inherent in musicality, in other words, the vocal, visual, auditory, narrative aspects of mother-infant communication, eventually become full-blown examples of music and the other arts? How do we achieve attitudinal alignment and the concomitant emotional engagement in different art forms? Can we measure attitudinal alignment over time and space when considering reader and viewer responses to literature and visual art? How do we achieve attitudinal alignment in different social set settings, say in the classroom, in a meeting, between employer and employee? For AI research, can musicality be taught to machines? If so, how? And if not, why not? I hope these questions inspire us to contemplate the richness of our musicality as the basis of human communication and its considerable potential for creating meaningful and enduring connections. Thank you. when she doesn't have a good relationship with the other actors. It's it's just painful. And I would imagine it's because there's a lack of that, yeah, lack of that attitude in alignment. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, uh, you know, is it, you seem to be, you're suggesting it's sort of, it goes both ways, right, this musicality thing. I heard an argu argument once where they said that uh, sometimes big musical uh, traditions can have an effect on speech patterns. What, what is your thoughts on that? And for example, jazz on certain American dialects and, and speech patterns and, and stress patterns and things like that. There are, there are psychologists, music psychologists, who, who study that very thing. Um, one psychologist, uh, Anirou Patel, has studied that with, in French. He looks at French classical music and French, the language, and looks for different um, rhythmic patterns, and he's found some very general uh, <coughs> correlations. 
I don't know if anybody's really pursued that in much more detail than that. He's the one music psychologist that I am aware of who's trying to, to find those kinds of patterns, but clearly there's a lot of research to be done. This is a very new field. The whole idea of the speech to song phenomenon was just 1995, and it's, everything sort of burgeoned from that point. So there's a lot of work to do, to be sure. Any other questions? Yes. So yeah. I noticed in the repeated phrase experiment, all of the respondents were women. Did men show the same tendency to become musical after repetition? I think the reason why they did that is because, she, as a female voice, they wanted they did they didn't want to introduce another variable of having a, a you know male uh, respondents. So she actually worked with a choir. And so she knew that all of them were very musically astute individuals, and they were all female. And, and so that's why she, and I think there have been a number of other studies that have built upon this one, but this was the original study. So there may have been others where they have mixed gender participants, and, and I'm not aware of, of any of the results from that. I was just playing the initial one. I guess we have time for one more question, and then I guess we better skedaddle. <laughs> oh, in using the term attitudinal alignment, how precise are you being with attitude? Well, that's what the Cambridge researchers did. Uh, okay. That was their phrase, and, and I think it came from this. They had hundreds and hundreds of hours of these same-sex friends talking, and when, for a successful bout to happen, in, in other words, for them to be able to find the rhythm and the pitch that they were able to notate, um, it was when, what we might say there was a vibe between the two of them, and that was their word. They used the word, so when they were attitudinally aligned, then we noticed all these musical things happening to the, to the speech between the two of them. Yes. And when there wasn't the vibe, there wasn't anything. Because you can use the term attitude in a very physical way, at a level, the attitude of the airplane. And mm -hmm. so I'm sort of wondering about body imitation, body syncing, because we that's also been studied heavily, how imitated we are in facial expression, body posture. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just sort of interested in how much that plays a role. I, I think it does. I think it absolutely does. And I think was, that was part of the reason why they selected that term okay. to, to refer to what they were noticing. And I'm just borrowing that term because it's associated with that, that study, but you make a very good point. Well, I believe we're out of time and we have a class coming in here, so thank you very much for coming. Thank you.